Good morning. Um, hopefully, if you celebrated Easter this past weekend, happy Easter. And I'm going to mess with my hair for a minute. Sorry. I'm Joshua Pearsall with Practical Christian Lessons. And today, we're going to be going through John Wesley's What is an Arminian? Answered by a Lover of Free Grace. This is something he wrote much later in his life. Um, and, of course, it's answering the question, What is an Arminian? It did take him a long time to, to kind of claim that title, even though he'd been publishing a magazine called, uh, I think it was just called the Armenian Magazine. I'll, uh, I'll double check that. It'll be in the show notes below, along with a link to what I'm reading from today. I'm reading it from an article. I don't have a physical copy of what is an Armenian, but highly recommend it, and I'll be jumping into it today. Um, it's not super long, so don't worry about that, and we are just going to get into it, and we'll go point by point as he puts it, and I'll number the points as well. What is an Arminian? By John Wesley. 1. To say, this man is an Arminian, has the same effect on many hearers as to say, this is a mad dog. It puts them into a fright at once. They run away from him with all speed and diligence and will hardly stop unless to throw a stone at the dreadful and mischievous animal. 2. The more unintelligible the word is, the better it answers the purpose. Those on whom it is fixed do not know what to do. Not understanding what it means, they cannot tell what defense to make or how to clear themselves from the charge, and it is not easy to remove the prejudice which others have imbibed, who know no more of it than that it is something very bad, if not all that is bad. 3. To clear the meaning, therefore, of this ambiguous term may be useful to many. To those who so freely pin this name on others, that they may not say what they do not understand. To those who hear them, that they may be no longer abused by men saying what they do not know. And to those on whom the name is fixed, that they may know how to answer for themselves. 4. It may be necessary to observe, first, that many confound Arminians with Arians, but this is an entirely different thing. The one who has no resemblance... The one has no resemblance to the other. An Arian is one who denies the Godhead of Christ. We scarcely need say the supreme eternal Godhead, because there can be no God but the supreme eternal God, unless we would make two gods, a great God and a little God. Now none have ever more firmly believed or more strongly asserted the Godhead of Christ than many of the so-called Arminians have done. Yes, and do it this day. Arminianism, therefore, whatever it is, is totally different from Arianism. 5. The rise of the word was this. James Harmons, in Latin, Jacob, Jacobus Arminius, was first one of the ministers of Amsterdam and afterward professor of divinity at Leiden. He was educated at Geneva, but in the year 1591 he began to doubt the Calvinist principles which he had till then received. And being more and more convinced that they were wrong, when he was vested with the professorship, he publicly taught what he believed the truth till, in the year 1609, he died in peace. But a few years after his death, some zealous men, with the Prince of Orange at their head, furiously assaulted all those who held what were called his opinions. And having procured them to be solemnly condemned in the famous Synod of Dort, not so numerous or learned, but full as impartial, as the Council or Synod of Trent. Some were put to death, some banished, some imprisoned for life, all turned out of their employments and made incapable of holding any office, either in church or state. 6. The errors charged upon these, usually tar termed Arminians, by their opponents are 5. 1. That they deny original sin. 2. That they deny, they deny justification by faith. 3. That they deny absolute predestination. 4. That they deny the grace of God to be irresistible. And 5. That they affirm a believer may fall from grace. With regard to the first two of these, these charges, they plead not guilty. They are entirely false. No man that ever lived, not John Calvin himself, ever asserted either original sin or justification by faith in more strong, more clear, and expressed terms than Arminius has done. These two points, therefore, are to be set out of the question. In these, both parties agree. In this respect, there is not a hair's breadth difference between Mr. Wesley and Mr. Whitefield. 7. 
but there is an undeniable difference between the Calvinists and Arminians with regard to the other three questions. Here they divide. The former believe absolute, the latter only conditional predestination. The Calvinists hold, God has absolutely decreed from all eternity to save such and such persons, and no others, and that Christ died for these and none else. The Arminians hold, God has decreed from all eternity, touching all who have the written word, one who believes will be saved, and one who does not believe will be condemned. And in order to this, Christ died for all, all who were dead in trespasses and sins. That is, for every child of Adam, since in Adam all died. 8. The Calvinists hold, secondly, that the saving grace of God is absolutely irresistible, that no one is any more able to resist it than to resist the stroke of lightning. The Arminians hold that, although there may be some moments in which the grace of God acts irresistibly, yet in general anyone may resist, and that to his eternal ruin, the grace whereby was the will of God, he should have been eternally saved. 9. The Calvinists hold, thirdly, that a true believer in Christ cannot possibly fall away from grace. The Arminians hold that a true believer may, ship, may make shipwreck of faith and a good conscience, 1 Timothy 1.19, so that he may fall not only foully but finally as to perish forever. 10. Indeed, the two latter points, irresistible grace and infallible perseverance, are the natural consequences of the former of the unconditional decree. For if God has eternally and absolutely decreed to save such and such persons, it follows both that they cannot resist his saving grace, else they might miss salvation, and they cannot finally fall from grace which they cannot resist. So that in effect, the three questions come into one, is predestination absolute or conditional? The Arminians believe it is conditional, the Calvinists that it is absolute. 11. Away, then, with all ambiguity. Away with all expressions which only puzzle the cause. Let honest men speak out, and not play with hard words which they do not understand. And how can any man who has never read one page of his writings know what Arminius held? Let no man bawl against Arminius, Arminians till he knows what the term means. And then he will know that the Arminians and Calvinists are just upon a level. And Arminians have as much right to be angry at Calvinists as Calvinists have to be angry at Arminians. John Calvin was a pious, learned, sensible man, and so was James Harmons. Many Calvinists are pious, learned, sensible men, and so are many Arminians. Only the former hold absolute predestination, the latter conditional. 12. One word more. It is not the duty of every Arminian is it, is it not the duty of every Arminian preacher first, never in public or in private, to use the word Calvinist as a term of reproach, seeing it is neither better nor worse than calling names? A practice no more consistent with good sense or good manners than it is with Christianity. Secondly, to do all that lies in him to prevent his hearers from doing it, by showing them the sin and folly of it. And is it not equally the duty of every Calvinist preacher First, never in public or in private, in preaching or in conversation, to use the word Arminian as a term of reproach. Secondly, to do all that lies in him to prevent his hearers from doing it by showing them the sin and folly of it, and that more earnestly and diligently, if they have been accustomed to do so, perhaps encouraged in such by his own example. And this was pulled from the essential works of John Wesley, um, You'll find a few versions of it. This one is from the 2011 Barber Publishing, pages 1171, 1171 through 1173. And I will have a link to the blog I got this from in the show notes, so you can go find it there. Um, just a few notes I have. Um, Wesley did say some things that are contended as historical information. Specifically, did Arminius hold to Calvinist teachings as we would understand them? Um, there's a lot of debate on if he held to superlapsarian teaching and even infralapsarian teaching that wasn't necessarily required at the time. Um, though it's likely he held, he definitely held to reformed theology, the extent to which that impacted his views of predestination. We just aren't certain on, we don't have a lot of information from when he left, um, late in the first time. 
with Bezos' approval. We just, we don't have a list. He didn't write it out, and no one else wrote it out. What is it that he believes on predestination specifically at that time? Um, but I do think it's fairly plausible. He held some form of more Calvinist leaning understandings of predestination, but that's just speculation. I'm far from a learned scholar on that specific topic, so just just speculating there. Um, but I think this does a very good and short job of explaining what an Armenian is in comparison to what a Calvinist is, at least in Wesley's day, and even to our day. Um, a lot of these things are still true. You'll still find, for some reason, Armenians being accused of being Aryans. That accusation I still hear sometimes, even though it makes no sense. We're, we're, we're not Aryans at all. Um, I still he constantly hear the, you deny um, justification by faith alone, you teach works-based salvation. Even if you don't teach it, it's the natural conclusion of your teaching, to which my response is, no, it's not, and you can't prove it, and I can prove from Scripture that it's actually not our teaching nor its natural conclusion. But that's going to be a debate that goes on and on and on. But I think point 12 here, for me, is a really big thing. Is it is it not the job of preachers on both sides to never in public or private use the term Calvinist or Arminian as an insult, as a derogatory term, and to discourage people from doing that? That there are smart people on both sides. And this is true. Even in Wesley's day, in Arminius' day, in our day, there are incredibly intelligent people who are Reformed and Calvinist, and then incredibly intelligent people who are Arminians of various flavors. My, like, you know, myself, Wesley and Arminian, of course, I lean towards that. But there's tons of other types of Arminians. It's not just Wesley and Arminians. So I think this short, um, like a lot of things in John Wesley's day, there is still a lot of overlap with our culture today. And that goes from, um, you know, understanding of scripture and what was called the hermeneutic of suspicion, as Odin put it, and I think Wesley put it as well. And the way people approach the Bible extremely skeptically, and we still see that today. Um, overly skeptical is is the best way to put it. Uh, a hermeneutic of suspicion to where they just, they're not approaching the text to understand the text. They're approaching the text to attack it and to undermine it. And with this idea that I can't trust this, I need to be suspicious of it. Um, but that's a whole digression. The, this video is, is about this article. Um, yeah, let's go with article. Um, what is an Arminian? By a, by a lover of free grace, which has always been the focus of Armenian teaching, is free grace. <laughs> so I think it's an apt title by Wesley and a article that has as much impact in his day as it does our day. And I think it's worth reading on, reflecting on, and people on both sides, along with other things. Um, books I've recommended, like, where is uh, Roger E. Olson's Armenian Theology, Myths and Realities, Keith right here Keith Stangland and Thomas McCall's uh, Jacob Arminius Theologian of Grace I think it's worth both sides approaching these things trying to understand the other side before entering dialogue whether polemic or ecumenical and actually trying to understand the other side fully and properly and that goes for Arminians too right you need to understand Calvin you need to understand Reformed theology both because we do have in inherited tradition from Arminius that came from John John Calvin. He was influenced heavily by John Calvin. John Wesley was. Um, and to understand, right, people who are critics or who we want to be ecumenical ourselves with in dialogue, whether that's to build bridges that doesn't necessarily end in an institutional unity, but maybe a table unity, if that's what you want to strive for, like myself, or if just pushing for understanding that, and that way future generations can make more progress than we do in our lifetimes. Right, we gotta, we gotta work on these things and I think it's worth it. Um, with that, I'm going to end it here. You guys have a wonderful day and God bless.